Okay, so this lecture will be on the second chapter of Dominique Barthélemy's book, God and His Image. And the chapter is called Reasons for This Wrong View. Now, this is dangerous to say, but I'm going to try to make this lecture shorter for you guys. And I think that the material in the chapter lends itself to a bit of a shorter lecture today. So we'll see how that goes. <clears throat> Let's begin with a brief prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our minds with the light of your truth. Fill our hearts with the fire of your love. Move us from where we are. Change us from who we are. Guide us to where you want us to be. And transform us into your own likeness. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> so, put a picture of the book on the title slide here, as well as Caravaggio's painting of Narcissus. You may recall the myth of Narcissus is about a man who looks into a river and sees his own reflection and falls in love with it. And so, basically falls in love with himself. I thought this was an apt image of the kind of drama of sin and restoration that Father Bartholomew depicts in his book. It's really about a, the struggle between our own conceptions, our own ideas of who or what God is and who God actually is and the transformation involved in abandoning our own conceptions of God and opening ourselves up to who God truly is. To have the image of God restored in us is in a sense to turn away from our own self-reflections, which is what these false images of God are, and to turn toward who God actually is, which is much less clear, much less hard much less uh, uh, simple and easy to deal with, but is the reality um, of God. Okay, so let's start. <clears throat> so Father Bartholomew begins the chapter by talking about what's involved in the loss of Adam and Eve when they sin, when they transgress, transgress God's commandments in Eden. And he thinks there's really two dimensions or two aspects to this loss. The first, of course, is death. So they were told if they eat of the tree, they will die, and this comes about. They don't die immediately, but they lose the source of life that ensures their continued existence and their well-being, and so they eventually will run out of life. And so this is kind of the story of the origin of human mortality. So it's by kind of disconnecting ourselves from that power source that we then gradually come to decline. <clears throat> it's a form of entropy. Father Bartelme calls this the loss of a life that was perpetually renewed. This is the original image of the human beings in the garden of life giving way to life, this, this source of perpetual life that is involved with our original connection and relation to God, who is the source of life. And we not only lose this source of life, our connection to the source of life, but we are aware of it. So we are, if not the only creature, one of very few that are aware of the fact that we will die. I think it's reasonable to think that human beings are unique in this, and, and it's quite a, a distinction to be aware that one day you will no longer exist. And it's funny that we are about as certain of this as we are of any other fact about the world, and yet we've never experienced it. We don't know that we're going to die because we have in fact died, but we are somehow aware that our life is very frail, that it's fragile, and we look to past precedent for our evaluation of the status of our own life. And it is something that will eventually run out. So we not only are mortal, but we realize that we are mortal. And this is a fundamental condition of our existence as it is. 
But this is a result of falling away from God, according to the narrative from Genesis. So bound up with this, but distinct from it, is a sense of alienation. Now, this alienation is from God primarily, so it's the loss of any real intimacy with God, and then it has its effects in our alienation from one another. Adam and Eve start to uh, see each other as adversaries. Adam blames Eve, and the drama of, of, of human discord begins. It's also alienation from our own bodies. We have to cover ourselves. We feel pain. We feel struggle in a way we didn't before the fall. And an alienation from the world. So the ground will no longer yield up its fruit. We have to work hard for it. We find ourselves in states of confrontation and conflict with the world around us. So this alienation is both uh, with God with one another and with the world around us. And to the extent that we are aware of God, that we are part of something bigger than ourselves and that there's some ultimate reality, some ultimate source behind the world that we encounter, this awareness becomes a torment to us because like with Job, it leads us to naturally question what our place is and why we experience the struggles that we do. Father Bartholomew turns to an image from the prophet Isaiah to describe the situation. Prophet, the prophet Jeremiah, I say Isaiah, I meant Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah says that the people of Israel have made for themselves sources of water, cisterns, that's what that image on the bottom right is, that cannot sustain what they were meant to hold. They are broken cisterns. We have made these faulty vessels for that which sustains our life instead of relying upon the source of life, the fountain of living waters from which we can continually draw the things that we need to survive and to flourish. And this is directly analogous to choosing the wrong tree. Instead of choosing the tree of life, we choose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and so in that, we are forsaking life and choosing a kind of autonomy, a self-determination, self-dependence that will eventually lead to death. It's essentially about choosing the wrong source of life, the wrong basis upon which to justify our existence and orient ourselves to the world. Now, he calls upon the Hebrew phrase, dead water or living water. I think in English, this is more like sweet water and uh, bitter water. Water that's potable and then water that's not potable. You may have had this experience. If you leave water out long enough and it's, it doesn't move, it acquires bacteria, you can't drink it anymore. Sometimes it begins to, to even smell. And that water is no longer of any use. It's just going to evaporate. It's no longer really a source of life anymore. And so the Hebrew phrase for this sort of water was that it was dead. And from this came the notion that death really is about the loss of any hope. The water's still there, but it's no longer useful anymore. It's effectively dead. And the insight here is that if God is the true source of life, to abandon God is to dis disconnect ourselves from that source. And so... Our life remains, but like the water in the broken cistern, it's, it's stagnant, it's leaking away. It's really no use to us really anymore. And so real death begins with this disconnection from God because it's that point that we lose our horizon of hope, that our existence is leading somewhere that can amount to something really meaningful, that we can acquire for ourselves what we really want. Uh, what we're internally driven to uh, seek and acquire, we become effectively uh, in a state of death because we've lost hope. Okay, so what does he make of these two trees in Eden? The tree of life, he speculates, was not only not forbidden, but it was, he thinks, the source from which Adam and Eve drew this life that was perpetually renewed and that ensured their uh, safety. And the uh, cutting off of access to that tree, 
is what leads to this gradual entropy, this gradual loss of life and eventually death. So this tree of life is the constantly renewed nourishment for the life God has given. He describes it as a kind of umbilical cord by which we endlessly draw all that we need. And so I like that image of the umbilical cord because uh, it is that which sustains the child in the womb and the child in the womb draws all of its life, all of its nourishment, including its blood from that cord. And so if you disconnect it, then life will run out, um, cannot, cannot survive. You may survive for a little while, but uh, not for long. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, on the other hand, it represents the possibility of man determining for himself what is good and evil. So he describes this as man becoming the principle of his own moral conscience. That's the fancier way of describing it. To establish for oneself what is good and evil and to evaluate one's own actions in the world based on what one determines for oneself is good and evil. His analogy here is pretty basic developmental psychology. There seems to be this divergence between what we desire, what we enjoy, what we delight in, and what's good for us, what will actually lead to our flourishing and well-being. And we learn this fact fairly early on in life that sometimes our desires don't always line up with what is for our genuine good. And so when you have this disconnect between what we want, what we desire, and what will actually serve our interests, and lead to our good and well-being, then there's this constant tension in play. And the temptation here in choosing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is to decide that we will call for ourselves good what is delightful to us. He puts it very well. He says, it's as if uh, the human being were to say to himself, well, I decree that henceforth what is delightful to me, I will call good. And what is distasteful to me, I will call evil. So it's a way out of this tension. What seems desirable or attractive to me is not always what is in my best interest. Way out of that tension is to say, well, whatever I desire or is delightful to me, I will proclaim to be in my best interest. And it's at that point where one abandons this tension that one really leads into uh, a break from God, a break from this reality that is greater than us and what leads to our alienation from God. And notice that it isn't really about doing the wrong thing. It's not about making mistakes. So there's a distinction that he brings up here between doing what's wrong and going the further step of calling those wrong actions right. So he brings up this question, which is worse, sinning or doing something bad or consenting to do something bad or approving of some wrong action? Now, initially you might think, well, if you didn't do anything bad, just simply thinking that something bad is good is not as destructive, right? It's, it's not as bad. But actually, spiritually speaking, it is worse because you are then reorienting the whole system of values of what is actually right and wrong to yourself. And you don't even have to do anything to do that. But once you've done that, then you've lost your moral compass. You've lost your way of orienting yourself in the world. He says, God knows we'll slip up at times. So think of these as like sins, lowercase as sins. We're going to make mistakes. But is that real sin? No. Father Bertelemy will say that real sin, true sin, is the stifling of conscience. Is when you say, I'm tired of being hounded and contradicted by this sense of uh, wrong that's independent of what I want. And so I'm just going to ignore it. And so once you ignore the source of this tension between what is right and wrong and what you want to do, this is when you declare your true autonomy from God. 
So the forbidden fruit for Bartholomew is really the silencing within us of this divine call that makes us aware of our sins. Then he goes into the psychology of temptation. What's going on when Eve actually is speaking with the snake and eventually takes the forbidden fruit? Now, the snake's tactics are subtle, and they're based on deception. And this deception is very subtle, cunning, I think is the term in the Bible, and it's very gradual. The best lies, Hitler once said, are those that are almost entirely the truth. The truth with a twist, right? Those are the lies that we get caught into uh, most. And this deception is based on confusion. So presenting something that is about 99% true, but 1% false, and it's hard to determine that 1%. So the snake approaches Eve and exaggerates the command. Did God really say you can't eat of any tree in the garden? Now, Eve may think, oh, well, I'm going to correct this misrepresentation, but she's drawn into the exaggeration as well. So Eve says, no, 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 it's just this one tree. And if we even touch it, then we will die. But of course, that itself is also a misrepresentation. So once you have this uh, small leverage point of deception, you can create uh, a kind of obsession with getting it right. So notice the focus becomes on the command. He focuses on the command rather than the bigger picture, the relationship that the command is meant to protect. So she becomes narrow and narrow in her focus. And this opens up the opportunity for the snake to call into terms the relationship that the command was meant to serve. You begin to question, well, I don't really understand this command. What, what if it was just meant to confuse me? What if this is a big joke being played on me? What if God isn't who he appears to be? What if he's holding me back? What if God's interests aren't aligned with my own interests? And so it's at this point where she begins to entertain these questions that we really have the tipping point of the first sin. Father Bartholomew says that her imagination speculates and embellishes the tree, the object of God's ambiguous command, with a peculiarly attractive aspect. And this is the point at which sin enters the world, according to Father Bartholomew. It's not when she picks the apple, it's not when she eats the apple. It's when she begins to imagine that God may be different than what he appears to be, that God may not be trustworthy, that God may be set against her, maybe exploiting her, holding her down. She turns away at the moment that she lets her mind play with what the serpent suggested, that she leaves herself open to this fascination of doubt. So it's when she begins to imagine alternative understandings of God that <clears throat> her connection with God begins to sever. And in this way, the snake isolates Eve. She, she, he isolates her perspective. So she's beginning to spin things around in her own mind now. And I think this is very instructive. The more you are left to yourself, locked into your own perspective, the more you can become obsessed with something, the more you can begin to imagine things, the more paranoid you might get. And once you sever these relationships, which kind of ground you and orient you in the world, that's when things can begin to go wrong. And she eventually begins to forget who she is because she loses perspective on the relationships that are defining for her. And so after eating the fruit, then we begin the whole human drama of masking ourselves of putting on appearances. This is what really the meaning of the whole nakedness theme is. It's not a sexual thing in the Bible. It's more about humiliation or destitution. It's about leaving oneself open and vulnerable and particularly vulnerable to, to shame. So it's a mark more of shame and poverty than it is anything sexual. And in order to uh, correct this state of humiliation or destitution, we have to put uh, some sort of cover on ourselves. And it's at this point that appearance begins to eclipse reality. When the reality of who we are on our own, unadorned, becomes unbearable, then we begin to make plans to alter our appearance. 
we make do with appearance. So we can no longer bear to have others see ourselves the way we really are. And so we have to cover ourselves. And notice that this deception is contagious. It begins with a, a deceived, confused understanding of God, and then it leads to a deceived or confused understanding of who we are. And this self-deception then seeks to draw others into it. We want to include others in our own self-deception. Because the more we can convince others that we are the way we are appearing to be, the way that we want others to see us, that reinforces our own sense, oh yeah, maybe I am this way, this way that I am presenting myself externally. But behind all of that is really this wounded self that we don't want anybody to see. To be naked, Father Bartholomew writes, is to see these appearances totter, these masks, these coverings, to see this attempt to seem to be somebody fall to pieces. To be naked is just that, to see spread out before everyone's eyes the humiliation which we bear in the depths of our being. I think it's a very powerful insight into what's going on with the Eden narrative. We want the right profile. We want the right appearance. We want others to think of us in a certain way. And it doesn't really matter if that corresponds to what we really are. And the most vulnerable spot we could be in is for people to see who we really are deep inside. But of course, that's a condition for real intimacy. It's a condition for real love, for people to see us as we are, unadorned, without all of these masks and coverings and veneers. All right, well, related to this idea of wanting to appear other than we are, because we're afraid for people to see us, notice the fear, the hiding. The clothing and the hiding are intimately related in this story. And they're based on a distorted idea of our relationship to what's beyond us, to God, to one another, to the world. We begin to see these other things beyond us as sources of threat rather than well-being. These paranoid hallucinations begin to form in our mind. What was an openness to God becomes a relationship to something that's in our own heads. So we convince ourselves that God puts these commands to trap us, to trick us, to convict us, and then we think of God that way. And it's self-perpetuating because we base our actions on that. And then our actions, our motivations for our actions are dependent upon that conception of God. Think of the myth of Cupid and Psyche in the Greek culture. So Psyche is a woman that Cupid, the son of the god of love, comes to visit in the night, and Cupid falls in love with Psyche. But if Psyche were to see Cupid, he would, she would die. And so the condition for their meeting at night, their trysts, is that Psyche cannot see Cupid. Well, Psyche begins to entertain all of these paranoid delusions about, well, who is this strange visitor? I love him, but I can't really trust him because he won't let me see him. But of course, the reason is because she can't handle uh, the sight of him because he's a god. And so eventually she turns on the light and then it's heartbreaking, their, their love fades away. Uh, so our relationship with God is kind of like that. We don't really have the capacity to see God face to face as he is. And so we content ourselves with our own understandings of him, which eventually devolve into these distorted ideas in which God becomes a projection of ourselves. And we think, well, how would God deal with us if we were him? And oftentimes, we can't imagine him dealing with us in any other way than tit for tat, in, in a retributive manner. And so the notion of this vengeful God, this vindictive judge emerges. But the faulty premise is that God must be like us. God must be some more exalted or more perfect or more powerful form of us. And surely he wouldn't uh, forgive me or take me back or love me in my own condition. Again, I have to present myself in the best light. I have to cover myself. I have to hide from him. But this is where the uh, torment comes in because we know that God sees us as we are. And so we become ashamed, afraid, hiding. The loving father who once walked in the garden with Adam and Eve becomes this competitor, this adversary, somebody to avoid, somebody to navigate, to negotiate, rather than someone to, to love. 
and to depend on. And that the heart of this, Father Bartholomew says, is our inability to endure the idea that God could be generous, gentle, merciful, without limit. There's an unbearable gentleness to God. We would rather starve than have to return home to him and ask for what we need. And this is where he compares this drama with the parable of the prodigal son in the Gospels. Maybe we can talk about that in class. But the, uh, the basic idea is that we would rather be on our own and in need, hurting and in pain, than to present ourselves vulnerable and, and naked and unadorned before the one who loves us. Because we can't really bear the fact that God could love us in this state. We can't bear any love that we don't earn, that we don't deserve, that isn't really a product of what we do, of who we are. And so we ought to imagine a God from whom it would be justified to run away. And that, of course, reinforces our own actions and decisions. We become like frightened birds. This is how the chapter concludes. Who will only approach gradually and through hunger. We can only be tamed in winter. He titles one of his sections. And so this is the condition for humanity and particularly the people of Israel. God brings them back gradually, gently, and through their deep need that they come to eventually recognize. And I thought I would just conclude with one of my uh, favorite lines from William Blake from his poem, Black Boy, where he writes, we are put on earth a little space that we may learn to bear the beams of love. So I think one of the insights behind this whole drama of Eden and of sin and humanity's decline is that it's much, much harder to receive love than to give it. And that's the real trick of learning to uh, find one's own true self, of seeing in one the true image of God, is the learning to be what we are, which is creatures that are dependent upon what's beyond us. And we have to learn how to receive the love that we ourselves cannot earn or acquire for ourselves. Okay, so that's it for today. And I will see you guys in class. All right. Take care.